Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, this is the Penn State Technology Club, and tonight's guest is Jeff Carroll, and he will be talking about IPv6 core functionality and Wireshark. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. And thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, come in and talk. And with that, I guess we'll go ahead and roll it. So thanks again, everybody. We do appreciate you taking time out in your evening. It's middle of the week, so yay for that, right? And uh, we'll have a good little time. And um, I'm assuming it's most everybody's evening, but whichever might be uh, welcome nonetheless. So we're gonna talk a little bit about I IPv6, uh, call it the core functionality. Um, there is that GitHub link, and I initially called this presentation uh, IPv6 for the IPv4 brain. So if you go to that GitHub location, uh, that will be the title of that particular presentation, but it is all of the same slides as this presentation I'm gonna show, except for there's like two or three slides in just a different order but feel free to go grab that it's PDF. There's also a trace file there that I'm gonna be going through a little bit tonight as well. And a couple of other files. There is a, an IPv6 uh, cheat sheet and um, there's a, another kind of a Wireshark, um, not so much of a cheat sheet, but cheat document, cheats or you know, um, uh, good information documents that, um, another gentleman put together and had allowed me to make available, as well as a few links on uh, predominantly Wireshark uh, kind of based information. Uh, but we're gonna be initially kind of focusing on, uh, you know, IPv6 as it were. I'm gonna talk about some of the basics about IPv6 pretty much throughout a, a little bit here and there comparison of V6 to V4. So what you might, already know um, from various aspects of what we basically call IP uh, and more really formally now it should be known as IPv4 and kind of compare that to a couple of bits of IPv6. Um, can't, I don't know if we can really do much of a show of hands, but it, oh, there is a raise of hand perhaps. So if you've played with IPv6 before, I would say to any degree, um, on your own, whether you just kind of play with it locally, you've got a little lab going, do it formally, uh, raise your hand if you've worked with it at all. And uh, just kind of as a for fun to see, and uh, see, uh, well, I've got my hand and Adam's hand, and that's about it. So Adam, we're gonna let you do the rest of the presentation since you've got some uh, experience with it. How's that, how's that work out? I'm just kind of smiling. Yeah, sounds good to that. me. Sounds good. Okay, but I'm not going to tell you what the slide is as it comes up. Okay. No, please. <laughs> I think I got uh, enough at the start. I saw them at the start, so I, I'll go through it. <laughs> we'll have a good time. So, uh, I'm going to make a, a kind of a a, an int a little follow up comment to one of the chat notes is that um, uh, IPv6 is not new. Quote. Okay, I'm using the air quotes, if you could see. Uh, it's, it's not a new technology, but it is not a widely deployed technology. And so kind of want to say it that way for um, kind of some reasons, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about here and there on that. So this is kind of our plan of a layout tonight. I've got a couple of trivia questions uh, that I want to run through real quick. And so is IPv6 an enable protocol on what you would call modern day operating systems. And I'm gonna say modern day operating systems is for at least the eight, last eight years. Um, would you maybe think it is? Um, and uh, the answer is yes. It has been an enabled protocol for most of the modern day operating systems. Now I'm gonna give a, another little caveat to that of uh, client level operating systems, most server level operating systems, not so much the case for infrastructure operating systems and or applications. And I'm gonna give that caveat being uh, switch router and firewalls uh, have, uh, have typically not had V6 enabled by default and quite a few of them uh, didn't even support it for a bit of time till literally about the eight years ago. Well, some way more than that, but as a by and large. 
uh, but it has been enabled. Now, a lot of people have gone through and, you know, turned it off, uh, whether they ticked the box or unticked the box, um, or they did some sort of command to basically turn off V6. Um, I'll just say, however, that didn't always do it, and nor, neither any longer should we do it. Even if it's not being used, we shouldn't uh, be trying to deal with that. Another question is, on an IPv6 enabled interface, uh, would you have more than one IPv6 address assigned to it? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of throw this out to say, if a question like that gets asked, why, why would that be asked? Because if you think about it from a V4 perspective, you typically only see one IPv4 address on interface. Um, if you see multiples, we sometimes call that multi-netted or sub, uh, sub-net addresses. Uh, uh, um, um, and most of the time, they're in different network uh, prefix assignments. So they're not all part of the same network prefix. Uh, but generically, you should see on an IPv6 enabled interface one or more addresses. And, and we'll talk a little bit about what kind of addresses those are, and they could even be in the same network prefix. Uh, and we call a, an, an IPv6 route capable address a GUA, a global unicast address. Uh, and so could I have multiple GUA addresses that are in the same network? Uh, so could they be uh, 2001 uh, colon colon one, 2001 uh, colon colon two, 2001 colon colon three, uh, which means they're all in the same network of 2001 uh, colon colon, and then I had host IDs of one, two, and three. And the answer is you can, and you may have uh, up to four in the same network prefix. We don't have that capability in V4, meaning you can't do a 10.1.1.1, 10.1.1.2, 10.1.1.3 with all the slash 24 mask. Okay, it, it is just not possible in most operating systems. Uh, but in IPv6, you effectively could, uh, and quite often you will. Uh, and then it becomes how many different IPv6 um, addresses in different subnets could you have, and it's like a lot. Uh, not necessarily that much different from IPv4, but again, we don't, I would say, typically see this functionality in an IPv4 network uh, on client level OSs. We might in servers, we might in infrastructure, and I'm not gonna say we never do in client, of course we, we do, but as a general rule, we don't think of it in that operation. But in IPv6, it's actually uh, quite, I would say, possibly common, depending on an activity or two that's going on very specifically for that network. In IPv6, we have this other type of an address called a link local address. And uh, it's analogous to the APIPA address in most of the V4 uh, support of operating systems, i.e. that 169.254 uh, address. Uh, so we could have multiple link locals. If we have a system that has multiple network interfaces, whether it's a you know, client with multiple network cards or a server or uh, any infrastructure device, uh, the idea is could they all have the same exact link local address? And the answer is yes. And the basic reasoning is a link local address is not uh, routing capable. Uh, it is a reserved uh, block of addresses and you cannot route it. There's, at least I'll say it this way, there is no routing code that's RFC compliant that will allow the capability of routing link locals. I can use them all day long on a given subnet, but it's all at a layer two boundary. A uh, couple of more questions. Um, here's another one. Um, how does an IPv6 host get its default gateway? Who would say, well, from either DHCP or from you statically assign it? And if you were to say either one of those, uh, the answer is that's not how it works. It works because a router advertisement 
from the v6 router on that subnet told all of the v6 uh, devices i am your router and here is my address and you will come to me if you need to get off net uh, that is not the behavior in a v4 world in a v4 again it's either through dhcp as a scope definition or statically assigned in v6 in the DHCP services, there is no scope definition for a default gateway. Uh, there shouldn't be a inputable field for a V6 gateway in any other operating system. Uh, uh, however, that's not the case in Microsoft's code. There is an inputable field, but it is almost irrelevant. And in fact, if you put it um, in that field, it basically gets ignored because that is not the way IPv6 operates. And as a, a, a little sidebar trivia, DHCP operations in a v6 world uh, is DHCP v6. All right. It's not actually quote DHCP. DHCP is for v4. That doesn't mean that a quote DHCP server or application doesn't support v4 and v6, but the foundation speak for DHCP capability for IPv6 is DHCPv6. Uh, last little trivia question, and then we'll get to the real good stuff. Uh, how does a host communicate to its default gateway? Does it use its link local address or does it use its global unicast route capable address? And the answer is it uses its link local. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit more and see a little bit more of that in operation. This is what I was talking about earlier, that IPv6 is not new. The whole process kick-started a long time ago, 28 years ago, basically, well, maybe 27 and a half years ago. Um, and the reason that this came out at that time, and if you were in networking at that time, uh, IPv4 in that world, in that time, it was all manually entered, manually configured, and all quote, route capable, internet route capable, whether or not it was connected. Uh, and even then, we didn't have the public internet as we know it today. Uh, yet, it was just about hitting up at around that later 92 timeframe. And so it was kind of decided we're going to need more addresses than these, uh, you know, a little over 4 billion because of the way it was implemented. We didn't have RFC 1918 addresses. We didn't have NAT. We didn't even have DHCP at that exact moment. Uh, so with the idea that we're gonna kick off some uh, working groups to go figure out our next generation IP, and they called it IPNG at the time, um, uh, we need a few other technologies to help limp us along because it may take them a while. And so DHCP was basically, I'm not going to call it invented. It was a parallel um, of boot P functionality. Uh, then they came up with NAT. And then they came up with RFC 1918 private addressing, reserved addresses. And literally, we didn't need V6 anymore. And in fact, that's still considered an argument today. Well, we don't need it. Um, we've got all this stuff. And, um, and there you kind of see what was going on. That basically in 98, late 98, V6 was a, a foundationally defined, ratified, and we did see IPv6 implemented on the internet backbone, and it was a, a subcomponent called the six bone. Uh, and, you know, only a couple of router vendors supported it, and only a few systems uh, could do it, but they were doing IPv6 networking. So the question is, where was IPv5 in there? Well, IPv5 was effectively kind of in those, uh, uh, you know, middle 90s uh, time frame. And it was actually uh, uh, a, a, a multicast protocol that was kind of being defined that actually never went anywhere. And they were going to, and they basically assigned it to IPv5. It died. So that's why we we're at IPv6. Uh, at least as of, uh, you know, now. Uh, the biggest difference here in V6 is it's a 128-bit address, which means we have a possible 340 undecillion addresses. And that's just basically an unfathomable number. It, it sounds like a made-up number. It's 340 with 34 zeros on the right of it, okay? We get a lot of address. That's what that really translates to, a lot. And a lot of people get really... 
I'm going to say concerned when we say it's 128 bit addresses because, oh, wait a minute, I'm used to 32. I can memorize a 32 bit address. Well, we're going to talk about that here uh, very soon. A quick view of the headers for v4 and v6. Uh, and a little bit of what they really did in v6 was consolidate uh, some of the headers, get rid of a few of the headers, um, and uh, rearrange just a few little things. But for the most part, they streamlined uh, the protocol and, and the header component of the protocol. So that makes it a little bit easier. So a little bit on these other differences. In the V4 world, it's dotted decimal. Now we're up to colon hexadecimal. Um, oh my goodness, a colon. Uh, you know, it, it's a shifted character. You know, why didn't they just stick with dots? You know, or periods for our, our friends and family that are not into networking and technology. Uh, but a colon, that's hard work. But that's just the way it is. Uh, we're, we're back with a hexadecimal uh, numbering system because now uh, I, I can spell words in my addresses and hold that thought, okay? Um, we've got out of this 128-bit uh, number, uh, we break it up into 16-bit pieces, separate them with a colon, so now I've got eight groupings of 16 bits. Uh, a grouping uh, could be known as a quibble, uh, stands for quad nibble, or hextet. And really, uh, numerically, it should be a hexadectet. All right, but that's hard to say. And if you're from the South like I am, you got to add more syllables to any word anyway. So that's just a lot of work. So it's been shortened to hextet is how we refer to each 16-bit block. Um, and it kind of parallels octet that we're used to for V4. And so now it gets a, it starts to get a little bit easier if you think about, well, I've got to remember this big long number. Well, I've got another bit of info. But one of the things I want to comment is uh, don't put hex words in your public facing V6 addresses. It's cute to have Six Lab and Foosball in Dallas. Okay, we were doing this a long time ago in uh, IPX, SPX networking and Netware, Novell Netware. We were doing it in Apple Talk, all right, and, and a few other protocols that had hex. We were using words, hex words, but don't do it now um, because the, uh, uh, the bad folks are going to be looking for that. In fact, it's very easy to go get a 16 bits worth of, of, um, of hex word uh, databases and start searching on hex words. And so uh, you, you just kind of shouldn't do it. Now, if you want to do it, certainly, you know, it's yours. You do what you want. Uh, Facebook is a great uh, bit of that uh, because Facebook has in their system uh, or in their V6 address, if you ping facebook.com, all right, you're going to see right there F A C E B O O C in the fifth and sixth hex tests. So they're not listening to Jeff, but yeah, they're not going to listen to Jeff. But it's cute. They've got it right there. Well, okay, my quick little comment from a security thinking, you know, InfoSec mindset that's 32 bits of exact known information. So that's all already 32 bits less that I have to deal with if I'm going to do some kind of a <clears throat> recon of a network. All right, that's why you shouldn't put hex words. But again, it's your network, do what you like, but uh, we should be careful of that. The next best in bit of information of this 128 bit address is that it's actually broken up into two 64-bit pieces. The first 64 bits is your network prefix. The last 64 bits is your network or your host ID, uh, rather, or your interface ID, which is a, the a more official name for it. The 64-bit network piece is partially made up of what's assigned to an ISP or provider, um, 
uh, and or to a, I'll call it a larger entity, even like a Penn State probably has their own prefix up to so many bits, anywhere from, uh, you know, uh, probably about uh, 18 to 48. And then the last um, uh, 16 bits, typically in the fourth hex tet, is uh, assigned to, uh, we'll call it a user, uh, whether it's you yourself or smaller companies or whatnot. Um, and then the last 64 bits is however you want to do them inside your network. Uh, and this is variable as to how many bits you might get uh, from a provider. But the bottom line is, is the first 64 bits is your network. Well, that makes it a lot easier right off the bat, quote, trying to memorize because uh, you should know your prefix in your own entity as well as then know the, uh, the latter part of the network ID uh, that you have been assigning to the different subnets. So the interesting thing is a 64-bit network prefix yields 18 billion billion and change of 64-bit uh, identifiable hosts, all right? So already one subnet, one single subnet, and we could take the entire world's network connected devices and put them in one network. We could have one big monster flat network with everything. And we're not going to do that, obviously. All right. So a lot of people look at this and say, well, if I take it and just layer in V6 to my normal world, and my normal world only has, you know, a slash 24 addresses with only, you know, 200 so devices, uh, that's a lot of wasted addresses. And a lot of people do kind of start thinking that way. And kind of what we say is don't. Uh, we call that V4 thinking. And you can go ahead and stop right now because we have plenty of addresses. And in fact, most client operating systems will not allow you to have a larger prefix, meaning a smaller interface ID range. Most uh, um, uh, infrastructure OSs might allow for that, but most, uh, uh, you know, regular client Windows, Mac, uh, uh, operating systems, and Linux, all of those generally won't allow you to make a change. And so you can't make a smaller network uh, or maybe a larger network with fewer devices on it by default. You just, and, and we don't have to. All right, there's no reason to. A lot of people say, well, that means I'm going to have, you know, billions and billions and billions of addresses that are wasted, i.e. not used. And that is, yep, that's probably true, but that's just the way it's designed, the way it works. And try to get around it as sometimes more work and potentially will break things, even if you tried to go code it yourself. Looking at V6, we have a little bit of shorthand notation in the mode of we can drop leading zeros per hextet, all right? We can also concatenate groupings of one or more contiguous zeros to a double colon, all right? So if we look at the address from the middle viewpoint here, uh, and I and I invoke shorthand notation, then I could with option one here go 2001 colon colon dropping these uh, second and third hex tets worth of zeros to a double colon, and then a 52 so drop that leading zero, and then colon zero colon zero colon zero and then colon 3d 16. Uh, and so I'm hoping somebody's thinking, well, why didn't I just double colon this group? Okay. Well, I did in option two, but in option two, I, I did uh, 2001 colon zero colon zero colon 852 colon colon 3D 16. Here's the reason why it looks this way. If you put in two sets of colon colon, how many bits does each one of these represent? It could represent only one hex tets worth. It could represent 16 bits right here. All right, which means the A52 is part of the network. Well, we know that, but where would it live in relative position? All right, or this could have been um, uh, three sets of uh, hex tets. All right, so that would have made A52 as part of the interface ID. So you can't, 
do this. And I have yet to find uh, either personally or hear of any operating system, client server, infrastructure, regardless, that would even allow you to enter in a number with two sets of double colons. All right. You can't do it. If you ever see that kind of question on the test where you say, hey, is this a valid IPv6 uh, address? Uh, the answer would be no. That's a don't think, don't blink. If you see two sets of double colons, it's not valid. So I'm going to, whoops, uh, I wanted to back up a slide and say, in this mode, all three of these addresses are legitimate ways to enter in an IPv6 address. You can enter it in shorthand uh, uh, notation uh, or fully extended longhand, as it were. All right. And it should be accepted and should work. And I always give those caveats, right? Because, um, yeah, let's just leave it at that. The other little bit is, is how do you enter in your hex? Uh, do you put it in as lowercase or uppercase? So a couple of uh, definitions in the RFC basically state, one, uh, it should not matter whether you entered in upper or lower, but lower is preferred. Uh, another one is, it shouldn't matter how you might enter in shorthand or longhand, but shorthand is preferred, and the one that gives the most, quote, compression is the most preferred. So actually, option two concatenates down three hextets. So the option two should be the way we would do it, all right? but it shouldn't matter how you actually enter it in. The fun part is, is seeing what the operating systems do with that information. Some will convert it longhand to shorthand. Some will convert shorthand to longhand. Some will convert uppercase and lowercase the other direction. All right. So uh, it, <laughs> your mileage may vary. And, uh, and there you have it. It's kind of fun, though. All right. Uh, just a, a few things about the address types. And the key one here is IPv6 does not have broadcast addresses. All right. So everything that you think of as a broadcast type address is now what we call a multicast, but it's an on-link multicast. All right. So anything that I want to do uh, on link on my my layer two domain of this particular network that I need to find out what you would have thought of as a broadcast, um, like a neighbor solicitation type message, uh, is now an on-link multicast. Uh, so if you just kind of pull into that mode of, oh, V6, broadcast is as a multicast, uh, on-link multicast, just a different prefixed multicast uh, address then everything else is relatively the same, relatively easy to operate and understand from that viewpoint. If we look at the address scopes defined in a V6 world, they're similar to what we had in V4, uh, yet there's some of the operations are a little bit different. And then the naming conventions a little bit different. Um, we still have a, a local uh, not routable type of an address in the V4 world that was known as the APIPA address. Uh, we call it now the link local in uh, IPv6. If you want a routing capable, and my definition of routing capable, I'm going to say uh, it, it's routing route capable to the internet. Um, then, you know, we have that. We used to call them public addresses. Uh, we also have an analogy to a private address likened to the RFC 1918, but it's, it's a little bit different, but it's used in roughly the same idea. Uh, and we call these uh, EULAs, U-L-A, all right, or unique local addresses. And it's defined in RFC 4193, and uh, it's routing capable within your domain, but not to the internet. Uh, because it's a reserved prefix, it's easy to block. Uh, one, the provider should not allow those types of uh, prefix addresses coming in. And two, neither should you. You know, when your uh, forward facing uh, router should be blocking those addresses. You should never get them, but you should block them. Just like we do in the real world where we block 10 as well as our ISPs block, you know, 10 dots, all of the RC, pardon me, all of the RC1918 type of addresses. Now, uh, one other particular difference here is, 
in a V4 world, if you start up most modern day operating systems without either a DHCP server or statically configured addresses, they will come up with that up PIP address, the 169.254.18. Uh, However, once they get an assigned address through DHCP or through static configuration, that a PIP address goes away and it's no longer used or usable on that interface. In a V6 world, there's a difference and we kind of made that statement earlier of how it's used, one of its ways it's used. Uh, V6 will always have a link local, all right? Regardless of what you want to do, if it's V6 enabled, it will have a link local, all right? If you give it a, a static address, uh, a global unicast static or EULA address static, um, or they are derived through DHCP v6, the link local stays. It does not go away. And link local addresses are used for your local communications by default, i.e. your layer two domain. Um, and then your, uh, your route capable addresses know to go to the default router uh, that it learned from the router advertisement. Do we get to say that again? A quick little sheet on some of the address kind of comparisons and some of the reserved blocks. Uh, very quickly, the uh, FE80 uh, colon colon looking prefix, all right, is known as your link local. It's a reserved block, a reserved prefix. So if you were just to, to very simply uh, go into, you know, your environment, your operating system, and like, I, of course, I'm on Windows here, we can tell that. And very quickly, we can see uh, right off the bat here, well, <laughs> within two interfaces that are alive, they have link local addresses, FE80 colon colon, all right? They don't happen to be the same and that's okay, but they could be. Uh, we also see an address here starting with 2001. Um, and uh, that is one uh, or part of the assigned range. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, minimize that again and go back into here. Uh, the basic assigned range today is out of the 2000 to 3000 or 3FFF block, okay? Those are what's considered the global unicast addresses that are assigned by IANA to the five IRR, RIRs, regional internet registries. And so if you were to go to a provider and get an address, most likely today it will start with a to something, you know, 2000 something. Uh, the original six bone network happened to be, or used to be three FFE, uh, but they actually turned it back over to, I to IANA. Um, so everything up to 2000 and everything from 4000 on through the kind of FF block and the F80 block and a few FC100 block. There's a few blo small blocks that are, that are assigned for specific use, but everything else is considered unassigned. I had a really great uh, 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 Twitter conversation last year. Uh, somebody was talking about V6 address and they, uh, imp they, they did something, let's just say out of the 4,000 block and it worked. And I'm like, or, or they asked if it worked, something like that. And I said, no, it won't. And somebody else said, yes, it will. And I'm like, well, no, that's not part of the, you know, assigned. And, and the kind of follow on was, well, that's true, but it will work because it's still a legitimate, you know, address uh, capable or V6 capable functionality. And so it became one of those, I had to try it. And so I actually, you know, fired up a couple of different router vendors code uh, and a couple of different clients and, and played with it. And sure enough, they will work. You just can't route them to the public internet, but you can do it anything outside of that 2000 to 3 FFF range and, and basically will work to your world. So a couple little bits. Uh, another uh, uh, reserved address, and you'll see this quite often, is 2001 colon DBA. And that's reserved for documentation or labbing or examples. Uh, anytime you want to just show something without exposing a public address that you may have assigned, you can use 2001 DBA. And it's fully routable within your domain. It's just not routable uh, to your provider. Or let me rephrase it. They should not be accepting a 2001 DBA 
you know, address assignment or address uh, uh, advertisement uh, from you if you happen to send it, but you shouldn't send them, as they say. So we'll see commonly 2001 DBAs in, in, in exampling, uh, anything from in the 2000 slash three for uh, real publics, uh, FE aiding is link local. You see some from the FF 100 block, which is all of your multicast addresses. Uh, and depending on like FF01, FO2 and, and on are either on link or off link multicast uh, prefixes. One of the things that they wanted to do with V6, because remember again, early 90s, we did not have any auto processes for V4 addressing. It was all manually done. Every single system connected had to have a, this V4 address manually configured. So they wanted an automated way of doing everything. Turn it all on and it just, everybody gets an address and they play nice. And how do you do that? They came up with the idea of, well, we need a 64-bit host ID uh, to be self-derived. We're going to get our network prefix from our router advertisement. And the router advertisement is also going to tell the system, here's your network prefix. You figure out your own host ID. How do we do that? What's common across all platforms but is unique on every individual platform? Well, they came up with the MAC address as a, as a base, but it's a 48-bit address. Well, I need a 64-bit space. Turns out there was an existing IEEE standard called the um, uh, Extended Unique ID functionality, which basically took a 64-bit, or excuse me, my bad, I'm going too fast, a 48-bit MAC address, split it down the middle, and padded it uh, with FFFE. And now I have a 64-bit basic address. However, the V6 uh, task force didn't want to use just that. They wanted it to be slightly uniquely different that it be a V6 uh, derived address. So they went and found a bit that wasn't really being used. They took it, it's the seventh bit of the first byte and you invert it. So you take a 48-bit MAC address, you, you run the UE64 process, and then you run the V6 process on that, and now you've got a 64-bit address, or at least a 64-bit number, to uh, uh, add to the network prefix, and now you've got your full 128 bits, and it should be unique. All right. Uh, yay, great and wonderful. All right, first time I saw that, uh, my initial thought was within about 15 seconds or so is, well, that's not that unique. I can figure out what those are. If I get on somebody's network, look at the host IDs, you just reverse that flow. So uh, now the worst part about it is they can track Jeff because my host ID in this thinking will always be the same. So if I if they find where Jeff, you know, find that I'm Jeff by an address, now they can figure out where Jeff is going because of this address. So another standard was brought about basically using a random number generator to generate the 64-bit host ID. And um, what they also decided was, well, that's all great and wonderful, uh, but let's also come up with a second 64-bit randomly generated number that gets derived and we'll call that a temporary address, and the temporary address should be recomputed on a frequent basis of some type. And therefore, it's even considered more secure because it's random and it's timed. So they're not going to find Jeff. Yay. Well, here's the problem. A random number generator still needs a start point. Um, one particular vendor used a very common number to start their random number generator process from. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. But the number that they chose was using a MAC address of the device. So you could actually uh, get their algorithm because if they don't keep it secret and reverse engineer it. So great, we've slowed the bad folks down by an extra five seconds, you know. Uh, but the temporary address does help because it's, it's, um, uh, more work that they actually could use for its computation. And again, it should change on a frequent basis. The downside is the change on a frequent basis uh, is not defined in the RFC. So uh, 
Microsoft, as long as an interface is energized, will keep that same generated address for 24 hours. At the end of that 24 hours, it will see, can I still use it? And if it's still available, it'll use it. It'll keep that process up for seven days. After that, it'll recompute. Now, if you down the interface, shut down a computer, you know, disable the interface, unplug it, whatever, everything will start over again. Um, Mac OS will recompute every hour or thereabout. You know, if it's kind of a uh, partially still in play, they'll they'll hold, but very quickly uh, they'll recompute. So. Uh, the temporary address is the one that's used. Well, that's the great news, right? It's uh, more secure. The downside is if you're doing some sort of uh, client server type troubleshooting and you're doing it you know, from a specific client to the server and your trace is just flying by, life is good, and then all of a sudden it just stops. Yet, you, know, you jump up and you look and you see the application still going, and that's because it probably just got a new address and you're not watching for it anymore. So it turns out a lot of people turn off the temporary address functionality, which most OSs allow you to do. It should be enabled by default, but a lot of people will turn it off. V6 has another unique property uh, in the lifetime state of its address. It has two kinds of lifetimes, one called a preferred lifetime and another one that's a little bit longer called a valid lifetime. V4, we only have one kind of a lifetime. It's called the valid. Uh, a statically assigned is considered a, an infinite life. A DHCP uh, derived is typically defined within the DHCP scope as to how long that address is good for. Uh, in V6, the preferred allows us to work and keep working till the end of that time. But at the end of that time, in the valid time means I can finish up current um, sessions. But any new sessions, I might need to recompute a new address and start all my new sessions on that new address. Or I'll verify if I can keep that address and then my timers all start over again. And so this basic operation here allows you to readdress a network on the fly in the middle of the day and nobody will know. Nothing will go down, everything will keep working. It's awesomely scary to see and it works. Um, if you've ever re-IPv4 addressed a network, it is not easy, right? You gotta tell everybody on uh, Friday, hey, turn off your computer, we're gonna be doing some stuff for the weekend. And you, know, you come in Monday morning and what, 20% uh, didn't either read the note, weren't there to read the note, couldn't follow directions, whatever it might be, uh, plus the other secret squirrel stuff that was found. The cool thing about V6, because we get a, a fair amount of information uh, in the router advertisement, uh, that router advertisement is telling the client OS what to do concerning V6 addressing. I'll talk a little bit more about that pretty quick. So uh, we can do these kind of things um, at, at any time. Um, so. Uh, can I have a little bit about that? Uh, looking at some of the discovery protocols, the neighbor discovery protocols, in V4 kind of spread across about three RFCs. In V6, it's all under one category. Basically, how I'm gonna find out about neighbors, how I find out about routers, what routers can tell me uh, through these. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the router advertisement is, again, a, a key integral operation, just like some of the other uh, functionality within the neighbor discovery protocol, like, you know, I've been talking to somebody, are you still there? You know, or I come online, got any routers on my network? Uh, those kinds of, you know, basic uh, bits of info. Uh, these are uh, just a couple, well, four of some of the key ICMPv6 message types related to this neighbor discovery protocol category. All right, they're all equally important. You cannot just block ICMPv6 traffic any longer on a subnet likened to the days of blocking ICMP, all right? ICMP is not necessarily a required protocol. ICMPv6 has pieces of it that are required. I don't have to allow it all, but I, I have to allow these four or literally v6 will not work, all right? Um, part of that overall design concept of V6, again, was 
auto uh, address auto configuration. Uh, that router advertisement was one of the pieces. The uh, self-derived capability of an interface ID was another. The clients would get this router advertisement and they would uh, uh, be told, as it were, how they are supposed to get an address. Uh, one of these uh, options is called SLAC, Stateless Address Auto Configuration. This basically is a uh, router advertisement that tells the client um, because of this A flag being on, I'm going to give you your network prefix. Uh, these other two flags being off tells the client and you generate your own interface ID and add my prefix that I gave to you to the front end of that and there's your V6 address. That's a, generally the default operation of V6 routers. A lot of people say, well, I don't want that. I want DHCP v6 operations. No problem. To do H, uh, DHCP v6, we enable what's called the stateful version of our router advertisement. We turn this A flag off and we turn this M flag on. The A flag stands basically for auto config and the M flag stands for managed address. So this tells a client, uh, I'm not giving you nothing. You need to go ask a DHCP v6 server for an address. And, you know, they should help you. I'm done. That's all you need to know. And so, therefore, a client should now send out a, a solicit message for a DHCP v6 server, and then they should reply. I've got a little slide to show that here in a minute. There's also a hybrid. Uh, Slack didn't initially provide us with things like, oh, our DNS and our domain name and, and other bits of information. You either had to statically configure them or implement what was called stateless DHCPv6, which said, well, I'm going to give you your network prefix, but ask a DHCPv6 server for all of the other options, not for an address, just for all those other options, time server, download server, domain, uh, DNS, et cetera. Now that has been augmented that we do have a few extra fields now in the router advertisement uh, known as RDDNS. Uh, and it allows for the domain name and, and uh, DNS server in the router advertisement. Yet not all client and server operating systems even today support that. In fact, the Windows 10 didn't even support that till a couple of years ago. And all of the prior versions of Windows don't even support it and most likely won't. So this is, could become a handy chart um, to understand when you're setting up your router. Uh, the router vendors are really great about telling you what flags do what, but they don't tell you what flags you should have for maybe a specific level of operations. That's literally, uh, where I ended up putting this together. DHCP v6 process, again, when the client is told to ask for DHCP server, um, they will send out a, uh, a sequence that's known as SAR, very much similar to our DORA, all right? So the router advertisement comes out. If you see a solicit message coming right after that, that means that it's probably a DHCP v6 environment. A client's looking for a DHCP v6 server. Uh, DHCP v6 server will reply with an advertise, here I am. Client says, can I have an address please? And the server says, sure, here's your, here's your address. So the functional process is pretty much the same. What's in there uh, is a little bit different, i.e. no default gateway, all right? No default gateway definition in v6. There's a lot of people aren't happy with that. There's actually a draft RFC where they're trying to change that. Uh, there's somebody's DHCP v6 server application, not Windows, not Microsoft's, um, it's a Linux based one that actually supports that functionality. Uh, and I think there's a bit of Linux code that's been modified, but it's not a, a by and large uh, function. Okay, uh, one of the things we have to do is always validate that we have a unique address. It's called the DAD test, all right? Uh, so I get an address, however I get that, self-derived, statically configured, told by the route advertisement. I always have to make sure that my address is unique. I will do the DAD test. Uh, so this is just as susceptible um, uh, to attack in, as in V4, meaning I can put something out there that says, yep, that's me, yep, that's me, yep, that's me. And so you never 
can get a good address because somebody already says, I've got it, I've got it. Same attack vector in V4. A bit about the routing protocols. The key thing to know is here is V6 routing and V4 routing are completely separate, meaning generically you'll have two routing protocols. Uh, slight difference in uh, ISIS and uh, BGP uh, because they are both multi-protocol, but for the most part, if you've got an OSPF environment today, then you will also have OSPF V3 supporting IPv6 routing. Uh, so just a little tidbit. Uh, looking at V6, how can I use a V6 address in some of the applications? Well, if you remember in a V4 world and like a URL, if you did 10.1.1.1 colon 8080, no problem. Could a colon's used for that delimiter for a port? Well, in a V4 or V6 address, colon is not used exactly that way, but it is. So in order to use a V6 address, typically I've got to surround it with square brackets. Then I could do a colon or anything else after it. Uh, most applications support this uh, uh, functionality. Um, so we see uh, a global unicast address, all right? 2001, 470, that's a global unicast. You, you uh, hopefully after a period of time, we'll start to, to recognize some of that. Um, there have been over time, a couple little browser add-on utilities that will actually tell you, are you doing V4 or V6 or some combo like this here? Shows that, uh, you know, to get to that URL, predominantly it uses a V6 address, but it also, and everything else that it accesses may have some V4 components. So this is really handy. Pretty much only available in either Firefox or Chrome. Uh, and uh, they're just fun more than anything else. Uh, other applications, like if you're uh, going to do Telnet or SSH, again, generally you'll see square brackets getting over to it. Uh, uh, things like downloading you know, code or uploading code using TFTP. Um, we would do uh, appropriate things here. And in this case, I didn't have to put it in square brackets. This happened to be a, a router vendor and, uh, of their code, but I copied you know, a running config up to a TFTP server which was actually this one here, <laughs> or oops, my bad. Where was it? RDP, TFTP, oh, I didn't even show that. My apologies, I didn't show the TFTP server application. Um, uh, oh wait, you know what, that is it. That's the client sending it to this server. I will be okay. Uh, what else do we have? RDP, Microsoft is probably uh, humbly about the smartest uh, uh, in how they look at what you're trying to do in an application, whether it's either the command line or like RDP, you don't have to surround an address in brackets as long as it's using the default ports, okay? It's really cool. You do a ping, if you're dual stacked, it'll try to do ping in V6 first. Now, the nice thing about this is you can force some of these applications like ping at a Microsoft level, uh, if you do a ping, uh, ping dash four, uh, so I did, uh, you know, uh, ping Facebook, if I do a dash four on it, it'll force it on a V4. If I do it on a V6, it will force a V6. If I don't specify, it's going to try V6 first. And that's uh, not all applications. Some of them you do ping or ping six or um, same kind of idea, ping space dash six or dash four. Uh, or uh, paying IPv6 and the number, it, it just kind of depends. All right, I think uh, I'm gonna do just a little bit of uh, DNS here. Uh, we have a quad A record, which is the equivalent of what we think of as an A record. Um, look at the reverse uh, pointer link in here and every nibble gets broken down. All right, but fortunately most operating system or DNS applications um, will do that, It'll allow you to tick a box to say generate the reverse, reverse pointer. So I'm down to a few more minutes. Uh, we're gonna go at least a little bit past the hour, but hopefully not too much longer. Um, Wireshark and V6, if you've not played with V6 much, now is your opportunity. Go to that GitHub site or just go look for IPv6 traces. They're out there in the wild and bring it up in Wireshark and then implement or invoke a few of these uh, IPv6 display filters. If nothing else, just to get it 
uh, slim and trim on your eyeball so I don't have to deal with looking at V4, I can have an all IPv6 looking trace. And that's kind of what this particular view is here. You notice in the small print, I've got an IPv6 display filter. So this is say, give me only anything that's IPv6. Uh, you can kind of see down here at the very bottom, there's 2,700 packets of those 1,100 are V6. Uh, I've also implemented some color rules in here so that I can see some very specific event packet types. I want to know router advertisements are happening. I want to know router solicitations from the uh, client devices are happening. Um, I've actually even more recently covered all my color differently, my DHCP v6 traffic to make it more unique. And so if I'm looking at a live trace or a trace file scrolling through it really fast, I see the colors fly by, I know what's going on, uh, or I see what I'm expecting to see. And that becomes uh, very, very handy uh, if you're working with v6. And especially if you're uh, wanting to uh, look at uh, not, your network live. You know, look on your live network, home network, uh, office network. If you're allowed to run IPv6 on your office network, be advised. Um, or just get a static trace file. Uh, again, like I've got up there. Here's that little cheat sheet. Uh, it's one I put together some years ago, uh, combining a bit of information that I wanted. Uh, that was you know, kind of a summation of about a dozen different cheat sheets. So that's in the uh, GitHub as well. Last little bit uh, in your in that uh, the PDF that's on the GitHub is a link to some of the V6 uh, public uh, uh, books, published books. Uh, I would kind of say they're now starting to feel a little old. There's been about uh, three iterations of time of books published. Basically, the very early 2000s, the uh, mid late 2000s and then about the uh, early mid 2010s. Um, we've had some changes in the RFCs over time, uh, but not so significant. The, there were changes from kind of the early days. Let me go back up. Uh, I can't get the back button going. Uh, each one of these books that I've got referenced, and there's others, uh, kind of are on a focus. Um, a generic one, kind of the guide to TCP IP goes through both V4 and V6, about 50-50. Uh, the V6 security book, um, same kind of thing. Scott and Eric did a nice job kind of rolling up all, you know, security kind of focused ideas and concepts. Um, uh, in Laura's uh, book for Wireshark, there's a, a chapter on V6. Um, uh, Sylvia's book, V6 Essentials, uh, she's been working in V6 as most everybody there in, in these publications have been for a long, long, long time. A nice generic kind of overall reference about V6 and, um, and, and different platforms. Uh, Rick's book, V6 Fundamentals, has a bit of a Cisco flavor and kind of focus only because he um, uh, is a college professor and also teaches Cisco courses. Joe's book on understanding V6, he was one of the very early, early uh, tech writers on V6 at Microsoft. So this has a very Microsoft look and feel on it, flavor, examples, the whole bit. Um, uh, Ed's book on uh, uh, V6 and, and, and admin and Windows admin, very heavy focus on Windows and server, uh, Windows server uh, platforms. Um, uh, Tom's book on address planning, great ideas, great uh, 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 worksheet uh, methodologies to follow about, you know, how do you address an environment for V6 now? That's uh, what most people are going to want to do is parallel it to their V4. Uh, but uh, how can you maybe make it smarter yet? Um, and because of the capabilities that we have in V6, we're not having to worry about squeezing addresses anymore. Um, we should have plenty. So that is the slideshow. So I'm going to break really fast and go to Wireshark. So this is the trace. You've got this in that uh, GitHub. Uh, again, it's a small trace, 2,700 bytes, but it's got a lot of great stuff in it. The very first thing I'm going to do uh, is point out that I've got a number of shortcut display filters already configured in a V6 profile. If you've not played a lot with Wireshark, these are some tidbits that you, I'm going to say, should start thinking about. 
all right? Create profiles for different views. Like this is my V6 view. Uh, let's look at my SNMP view, all right? Not drastically different here, but look at my shortcuts. They're all SNMP based, right? If I want, do I have any SNMP traffic on here? I do not. Okay, don't need to worry about that any longer. All right, so let's get rid of that filter. Um, uh, what's another quick one? Uh, where's my open flow? Open flow, all right. Uh, look at my, my filters, look at my layout, everything changed. Do I have any open flow uh, in this network? I do not. Well, let's quit looking at that stuff and go back to V6. Change my profiles, change my view. Let's go look here very quickly at V6 only traffic. Again, out of 2,700 bytes, there's only 1,100 down here and change. And you can start to see, if I grab the scroll bar and look through, I see orange, I'm happy initially, all right? I see a few other colors uh, and I see some other traffic type. Oh, there's a pink, I wanted to see a pink, a pink router solicitation. That means a client just came online and basically said, any routers out there, okay? So that's a good thing to see. I expect to see that. And right after a pink, I see a red. I'm really happy because that means a router replied. All right. So I look for those kinds of milestones in my traffic. Uh, if I see router advertisements, that's okay. Routers are supposed to send them out on a periodic basis. So I like to see them. Um, what else is big and fun in here? Not necessarily a lot at this stage. But let's do this. Again, using shortcuts, display filter shortcuts, shortcuts, I wanna look at just router advertisements. And what I see here is a couple of different link local addresses for routers, which means I've got two routers on this network. Now, this is not expected. This is possibly not a good thing. Uh, and I see it early on in the trace file was advertising this, what I'm thinking is not a good router. And then it was quiet for a while, then a couple more, and then again, it got quieter. So I have another really cool filter in here. Let me, but it's in a different uh, view. And then I'll kind of be quiet. Uh, here is uh, looking at router advertisements and I wanted to see the flags. Uh, what's the M flag or A flag set? Well, if I look at the very first one up here, F V80 colon colon five, I know that's my router. And the M flag for DCP operations is set. I see this other router come online and I see not the M flag set, but the A flag set, which means anybody that hears this, you, I'm gonna give you your router prefix or your network prefix and you do the rest. The client OSs are supposed to do what they're told to do with the router advertisement. Almost no matter what. Different OSs will react differently. Some will drop their DHCP address for their new one. Some will wait till it's finished. Uh, some will just keep what they have and add. And so what this invokes on the network is um, things that were working and then they don't work and then they do work again. It looks like intermittent problems. The user's experience is, well, I was working just fine and then it quit. Oh, wait. Well, then it's working again. Oh, wait. It quit and it's not working, it's not working. Oh, the network's broke, wait, wait, it's working again. A rogue router doing this kind of operation will basically uh, be exhibited to the clients that way because their client will just be changing addresses. Uh, the worst one is, is when a router comes in line like this and is very frequently sending out its um, router advertisements and it's using, it's doing the, um, uh, you know, device in the middle type of attack, where it's basically telling everybody, you come to me, I'll still get you wherever you're headed, but I'm going to grab all your traffic, right? And, and uh, yay. So uh, a, a rogue router could be just doing wreaking havoc, uh, or a rogue router could be grabbing all the traffic. Um, okay, back to my standard one. Uh, another uh, filter that I run a lot is I want to see router advertisements, router solicitations, and DHCP traffic. So like here, I see a router advertisement, and then not too soon after, I see a solicit, which means, all right, somebody just got uh, uh, my router advertisement. Look at how quick they were happening over here in, in sequencing. And so that client probably had been 
uh, told by the other router what to do, and now my router is telling it, no, you need to go ask for a DHCP server. So it does. Uh, and you can see uh, another one got the router advertisement, and you see a release reply, which basically is, hey, um, I'm, I'm done. So I can see some of this traffic. I want to see a pink right here. I've only got a few pinks. See a pink, see a router advertisement, and then we see somebody basically saying, hey, I've got it. Can I keep this address? Why, sure you can. Uh, another one here doing the same thing. So looking at V6 traffic, there's you know a fair amount of things uh, that could be going on that I could see. I don't know if I've got um, any dad tests. Well, I do. So I've got a protocol in there or a, a, a display filter to look for just the, the, um, the dad tests. Yeah, I saw something about dad jokes, but I'm not good at that. Um, uh, did anybody do any quad A requests? Yes, they did. You should see something on this screen very, very quickly. I've got quad A requests by a V4 address. All right. This came about because of a, an RFC known as Happy Eyeballs. And it was a functionality of the operating systems, uh, mostly client level operating systems, if configured for both protocols, preferred the V6 protocol. Well, because every V6 interface had a link local address, uh, a DNS query would first go out looking for a DCP V6, excuse me, a DNS on V6. If it wasn't there, it would take the couple of seconds timeout before it would say, well, nothing on V6, let's go ask it on V4. Well, that made things look like they weren't working well. It looked like it slowed down the network, hence the happy eyeballs RFC. And basically it now says, if you're dual stack enabled and you've got a DNS query, ask that query on both V4 and V6 and both as an A record and a quad A record request. So this is why you will see, because we're hoping out of, of those four options, something's gonna hit. So uh, we can kind of see here in some of this, this, v, uh, this DNS traffic that's available in this trace, uh, some of what's going on. And no matter how I learn, let's say that V6 address, where I learned it from V4 or V6, doesn't matter, it populates into my stack and away I go. Uh, we can look at pings, Okay, I can look at FE80s as source uh, packets that are going on, or um, uh, I've got a few other ones here, uh, I, even some RDP traffic. And as I was showing in that one slide a while ago. So the bottom line is in your V6 travels, get some packets, fire up Wireshark, look at it, look at it through these filter capabilities. Otherwise, now this is an easy trace file, right? 2,700 packets, V4, V6. And if you don't even change your colors, if you used everything at default, you know, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just all gonna look like this, all right? All the ICMP or ICMP V6 traffic is the same color, all right? Uh, there's nothing specific in here about any other types of packets in a default view. You know, here's some V6 traffic. It's still ICMP, all right? Um, so there's a router advertisement. If it's ICMP, it's all ICMP, ICMP V6 traffic is the same color at Wireshark defaults. So humbly take advantage of coloring rules and display filters if it works, some people don't like colors. You know, okay, fine, that's fine. I do, I try to find a color that works for me. These colors may not work exactly for you, but find something that helps. Uh, it helps in that travel of, oh, let's look at the various traffic and let's look at only V6, okay? Uh, you type these in here and then you can save them out uh, to these display filters. And the great part about this is this is all portable. And in fact, in that uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, zip files you can download off that GitHub site is the um, uh, 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 um, IPv6 profile that like I'm using now. Uh, because these are totally uh, portable, I can put these up on a you know share share site internally, or I can zip them, or I can you know as they say whatever I want. Um, 
and and share them. No, oh, I don't want to create that. Where did it go? Oh, personal config. No wonder I wouldn't go to the right place, right? Profiles. Those are all those same profiles that you see over here in Wireshark. All right. They're in folders. So you can share them. There's actually a link in there also for um, Andrew's site uh, at Sellstream where he's got a, a, a Wireshark profiles repository. All kinds of us have, have submitted, you know, profiles. But you can, you can take this, uh, you know, V6 folder and, you know, zip it. Uh, and it'll have everything in there, the color rules, the, the uh, display filters, the layout of the screen, the whole bit. Okay, so I've probably hit my slightly over an hour mark. Um, and I know it was really, really fast. Uh, I hope it was helpful to give you a starter into an IPv6 journey. From an InfoSec perspective, this is something you should start to know because one big thing, if you poll uh, not only within your company, but anybody else that you know, uh, ask them, are they running IPv6 in their network? And by and large, everybody will say no. And then you say on purpose. And then they'll go, what do you mean? And say, well, you've got it turned on. No, 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 we turned it off. Yeah, yeah, fire up Wireshark on any given subnet and, and just filter on V6 traffic, and you will probably see some, and then everybody will start weirding out. But the great news from an InfoSec red team perspective, nobody realizes V6 is on, so I can go do all kinds of scanning on a V6 network, and nobody's watching. The security team is not watching for V6 traffic because we don't run V6 on our network, yet it's enabled everywhere. I have a lot of fun with a demo where I come in through the public internet uh, using a V4 address onto a system that's compromised. And once I land on that system, um, I do a few things. And the next thing you know, I find out they're not running V6 and I light up V6. I put on a rogue router, I light up V6 and I start recon on the network on V6. Nobody's watching me. The red team is having a field day. And when they come back at the report, the blue team goes, where'd this come from? Yeah, you weren't watching for it now, were you? Okay, blue team's wigging out because they're not watching for it. And I humbly, I like saying these things and kind of pointing this out because of that very reason. It doesn't matter if it's, quote, not being used on purpose. It's still most likely there, and therefore it's a security hole. So um, InfoSec folks that are thinking this way and looking at this protocol saying, wait a minute, how can we um, take advantage, exploit? This is a great way. Uh, and it's, uh, I would say, a lot of fun. I was doing this basic same presentation at a, um, a big corporate. I'm down in Fort Dallas area. And they had seen me do this same basic thing at one of the InfoSec meetings, um, Hack Fort Worth, last year and asked me to come out and do a, a, a little lunch and learn. Uh, it was supposed to be for about two or three or four or five people. It turned out to be like 40 people showed up across all the different IT groups. And talking about this stuff from an InfoSec perspective, and the amount of uh, uh, raised eyebrows, open eyeballs, and flat out, what kind of comments uh, was actually surprising. And I find that by and large uh, industry wide. So uh, if you're looking for a little bit of a leg up in your InfoSec travels, uh, I would humbly say V6 might help provide that. I'm not gonna say it's gonna do everything. It's not gonna get you all the doors, but um, it's probably the least watched and the least known um, thing, you know, running on the network. You know, but it's the protocol. And the nice thing is, uh, if it's already enabled everywhere, it's, it's just a great time. Okay, I'll be quiet now. Uh, perhaps we'll do another uh, slightly different presentation at, at a future point in time. We'll just kind of see uh, how Ray and team want that. But I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to show my attack uh, demo at some point in time, because like I say, it's, it's, it's just a lot of fun to do and a very interesting thing to see. I hope you had a good time uh, listening to me fly through the, this bit of technology, kind of an introduction. If you hadn't seen it before, if you've had 
hopefully you picked up another little tidbit here or there. That's always my goal, to provide some information that helps in whatever level I can. I, again, thank everybody for coming in, taking time out of, of your evening and, um, and being a part of this. And um, that's it, Ray. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I can certainly talk about NAT and IPv6, and you uh, humbly should not use those two words in the same sentence. Generically, there is no NAT functionality in v6 because we don't need it, all right? Uh, however, there are a couple of variations of NAT like we traditionally think of it in v6. They are uh, categorized as uh, transition technologies. Uh, but again, they don't actually operate exactly the same way. And one of the biggest reasons why uh, we shouldn't do that is because we didn't have to do that in before in the olden days. All right, we didn't have NAT. And uh, the other misconception that, that you know, NAT is a, a level of security uh, is, you know, not really correct thinking. Yeah, it abstracts some stuff out from the casual uh, attacker, but for anybody who knows, you know, it's, it, it's just a slowdown mechanism. So we just have to be, quote, smarter in making sure that if I've got addresses that I don't want to be uh, visible or route capable, either inbound or outbound, then I just control it at my network. And past that, we don't really need to deal with it. Now, some people will invoke uh, EULA addressing, the unique local address, for inside their corporate network. But if we still need to get off net or, or, or out of corporate net, out of the corporate domain, I still need a route capable address. So my client could still have a GUA address. Again, we generically say GUA addresses are for outside routing and EULA are for inside. So all my local inside my domain traffic could be EULA and all of my external could still be GUA. Um, there's a couple of really nice write-ups out there that say, yeah, don't. But don't waste the time. Just do it on GUA. Be smart about it. It's not that hard. And truly, if you can't make that work, you're not a good network engineer. And I don't mean any disrespect. That's just kind of the general consensus. Um, so yeah, that's used. I, and, and I totally get it. But I'm running, you know, I don't know if you, you kind of noticed here, I've got a public address here. You know, I'm not hiding anything, uh, but I'm blocking at my firewall, what I'm doing and what's going on. So, you know, I, I would generically say, you could see that address. If I get rid of the screen, you won't memorize it. Can you attack me? You can give it your best shot. You know, I'm not going to say it's 100 blocked, but 100% blocked, but we should be smart. In fact, if you're in the security team, uh, you should have on your at least forward facing side of the firewalls and, and, and router ECLs, a, an exact duplicate set of everything that you're basically blocking, all the application ports that are being blocked from forward facing should be in both protocols. And people will say, well, I'm not running V6. It doesn't matter. Just put the filters in there. Because as soon as you light it up, it's a little bit harder for people attacking V6 networks just because of the, it, it is a big address block. However, depending on who you are, uh, the large companies or anybody down to every single one of us, I can go get my own completely assigned network prefix. And then it's public record. It's up on the Aaron database. So um, you could have your own V6 uh, route capable prefix. Um, and, and then it's portable. You could go from provider to provider. To provider. So um, NAT, yes, leave it for V4. If you're going to implement V6, it's just, as they would say, uh, uh, be smart be, uh, and be mindful of it. And again, you know, Wireshark on on uh, on the uh, external side, you know, the uh, um, you know the ISP side, and then Wireshark on the inside, uh, whether it's a home network or not, and, and just kind of watch what's going on, um, and see what might be out there. Uh, and there's a whole lot of write-ups about 
IPv6 and NAT. Um, some of them interesting and funny, and some of them um, kind of just more interesting. Uh, any other questions, team? Well, that looks like it, Miss Ray. All right. Uh, well, it's always a pleasure to have you, and I will definitely like to set up that other uh, presentation because it seems like we have some interest in the chat <laughs> for that one. So maybe next semester, since this one is just ending. Um, but like I said, it's always great to have you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out, and uh, have a good night. Thanks again, team.